Now, here's an entrepreneur who's probably been there and done that. He's traveled to seven continents, skinny dipped in Antarctica, swam with whale sharks in Mozambique, and danced the tango in Buenos Aires, all while building his business. Meet Carl Barraclough, founder of Libertad Apparel, world traveling entrepreneur and deal maker. Now, Being a world traveler throws up its own challenges, like what clothes can you wear that don't actually look like travel clothes? Not wanting to look like the man in the L.L. Bean catalogue, Carl said about designing his own travel apparel, good enough to dance the tango in Buenos Aires, good enough to impress the senoritas. That takes some homework. A good-looking stylish shirt that stays wrinkle and odor resistance for days at a time is not easy, but he put it to the test and raised $55,000 on Kickstarter to launch the project. So in this interview, we talk about how Kyle runs his business while traveling the world, life after Kickstarter, and advice for entrepreneurs starting out who, like Kyle, want to live the dream. So let's meet Kyle Barraclough on Founder FM. Founder FM. FM. You're listening to Founder FM with your host, Graham Brown. Hello and welcome to Founder FM. This is the voice of the entrepreneur. My name is Graham Brown. Today, we're going to go and travel the world. I've got an entrepreneur that I want to introduce you to. World traveler, founder of Libertad Apparel. We're going to talk about, well, living the travel dream. Traveling to all seven continents, the Jason Bourne lifestyle of the entrepreneur. Welcome to the show, Carl Barraclough. Wow, that's quite an introduction, Graham. Thank you. <laughs> Have I set the bar too high? <laughs> the Jason Bourne thing? Uh, maybe, maybe. I'll try to live up to what I can. All right. You've got to sell yourself. But I totally believe okay. your lifestyle, I think, is going to be inspiring to a lot of people out there. We'll Great. dive into your lifestyle and your story in a minute. But first of all, let's have a look at what it is that you do. What keeps you busy on a daily basis? Talk to us about Libertad Apparel. Well, I'm the founder of Libertad and I make travel clothes that don't look like travel clothes. A lot of us travelers, you know, the business advice out there is to always kind of do what you know or solve your own problem. And as world travelers in this community, you get a lot of travel products. And my whole thing is like really nice travel clothes that don't stink, that are highly wrinkle resistant and stuff that you can do transcontinental flights on for 12 hours and step off looking fresh and awesome. Mm. So that's what I do. So what is the problem with travel clothes today because you know i travel a lot you travel a lot is it just the fact that they stink what else well you know there's that and there's just kind of the overall style i mean you know i remember when i started traveling back in 2004 and when i say started traveling i mean world traveling like long distance long term kind of stuff i went to rei it's a great store and i thought that was travel apparel. You know, you hear this, I'm going traveling, you hear that word in your head, it comes out of your mouth, and all of a sudden, you transform yourself from this stylish person that goes around town wherever you live into this thing that wears oversized clothes made of (laughs) all weather gear and has lots of zippers and pockets and stuff like that. None of us really wear that stuff. So why do we do it on the road and why do we take a picture of ourselves next to the Eiffel Tower or the Great Wall of China wearing it? (laughs) Exactly. Do you think that the travel market has changed a little bit since 2004? Because maybe back then, the kind of people traveling the world long term were students, maybe retirees, hippies, that kind of thing. But now, there's a different group of people and you're sort of in that community as well you're in contact with that community for those people that don't really know especially you know where you're based in Chiang Mai as well can you tell us a little bit about this community lift the lid a little bit for us and understand what it's about well I think what you started to say there was people are traveling for different reasons now right exactly you know back when it was uh, you know here in America you know people would go and backpack across Europe and then Europeans would go and spend their gap year somewhere else. And that's still being done. But now we have a whole class of people that's kind of like the global class. And I don't think that it's, and that's a term I like to use more than something like digital nomad and stuff like that. Mm. There are people out there, there's the super wealthy that don't even have a country that just kind of roam from place to place on their yachts. And then there's people that live near me in Chiang Mai, Thailand, that might be eking by on uh, $1,000 a month. 
while they are trying to start a business. And so I say the global class to include both ends of that spectrum because everybody is out there traveling for their own purposes and trying to make a buck, trying to survive in this world. And, you know, as we get squeezed, you know, in your home country in Britain, and then certainly here in America, as we get squeezed in different ways by different laws and taxes and things like that, even if that didn't exist, when we talk about the job market and the shifts there and stuff like that, we have to, you know, people are looking to the horizon for new opportunities and there are no lands left to discover. So we are out there in the digital world and trying to make a buck online somehow and and then we realize it dawns on us one day, we don't have to be where we are. Yeah, totally. So we get moving. It's the what if question, right? What if I yeah. didn't need an office here in London or whatever, right? Yeah, most of the time you don't. Exactly. So what you're saying is that there's a whole class of people now who are traveling, not purely to go and see sites and, you know, check their bucket lists off, but they're traveling because they're seeking out a better lifestyle. And in a way, an interesting point you made, there's no new lands to discover, but there's a new lifestyle that you could discover, right? There's, That's right. Tell us a little bit about the lifestyle that you, I know I set you up with Jason Bourne and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> tell us what's the reality. Give us the skinny on what is your real life. Tell us about, you know, what you do and in terms of traveling around and so on. Cause I know you've been to seven continents. You've seen right. a lot of things, you know, make us all jealous. Well, you know, I started doing this as just a holiday traveler back in 2004, more of a long-term kind of thing. I had this corporate job. I did, and I actually ended up leaving that whole life, not because it was bad, but because it went too well. Right. I was making so much money that I said to myself, wow, this could be it. This could be how I live for the rest of my life. And that really depressed me. And so I hit the road. And so I began as kind of a, as a holiday traveler. And over the years... That's transformed into kind of a nomadic entrepreneur, although I'm not all that nomadic anymore. I do visit some places from time to time, but you get tired of border hopping and you start to get more interested in your projects and you don't like to leave your to-do list and your goals unattended and you start to want to create something for yourself, whether you have the money or not. So in terms of the lifestyle... You know, I know Chiang Mai has become very popular and I first visited Chiang Mai in 2005, long before the whole entrepreneur thing. It was kind of a hot spot on the backpacker trail then. And then when I finally decided to get to work, I found out that this whole group of entrepreneurs had moved into Chiang Mai that I had no idea existed. I was still hanging out with, you know, backpackers and stuff. Mm. And it was just really, really lucky that the time that I wanted to start getting busy with some of my career dreams or business dreams, that I didn't have to move anywhere. These guys kind of, it was really just lucky that they showed up. All of a sudden had just a wealth of resources in this community. But the lifestyle was the question. And by the time I started wanting to get really busy, you know, my funds had really kind of dwindled. You know, I wasn't broke or anything like that, but it was time for me to start watching the expenditures. And it's a good thing because, you know, me starting an apparel company, it's kind of like, you know, when you hear people wanting to start, you know, a restaurant or you read a, an interview with Richard Branson talking about starting an airline, everybody says it's a good way to go broke. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and they're right. It's been very financially draining. But satisfying, and I simply could not be in this position today were it not for Chiang Mai. Right. I live in a very small apartment. I drive a very simple motorbike, and I eat local food. I watch my pennies. But it's a very satisfying life. So I'm the Jason Bourne version that, you know, does not live in a nice place and drive, you know, BMWs or anything like that. But I do get around a little bit. And it is places like Chiang Mai and other places in the world that make some of these projects possible. Right. So why yeah. did you start an apparel company? Because for the reasons you said, it's a great way to go broke. And I'm sure right. where you are in Chiang Mai, they for every guy starting an apparel company, there's 10,000 guys developing a, a web app or a mobile app or some kind of right. online service where you don't need an inventory, you don't need to produce the product physically, you don't need to have suppliers. Why did you go down that route? Because that seems like the harder route to right. take. Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. The first and most important reason was that 
I had tried kind of my hand at a couple of other things. I'm not a tech guy. I had this idea before Libertad to develop this web app. It was a voting app. And it had a lot to do with uh, politics in the U.S. and the way we pass laws here and things like that. And I'm a little bit of a political person, like to read political news, at least I used to. So I had this really great idea. And this was going to be my first real entrepreneurial venture. I tried a couple things previous to this, but this one was to make this thing real was going to be a whole other level of execution. Mm. So I got a guy to build a prototype. So I built the prototype and actually advertised it on Reddit to do sort of a concept test, a market test, which, you know, I had just learned what that was and had just learned, you know, about the, the lean startup with Eric Reese and started to find out about Steve Blank and on and on. These were just the early, early, early days and got really good reviews from people. They really loved what I was doing. They loved the concept and I felt great, but I didn't do my homework with its commercial viability. Hmm. And, you know, I looked at like the online audience and the engagement and Huffington Post had kind of come out and said how they made their money. And they had a great way of, you know, illustrating how they make their money and, you know, what a click is worth and what a visit is worth and all of this stuff. And so this is something I should have done before I built the web app. And I really figured out that if I had 10 times the traffic to all the political sites and all the visits and shares to political articles. I put all this and I said, I multiplied it by 10 and I still wouldn't be making any money. Wow. You know, so, you know, I had kind of a, you know, I went to the guy that helped me develop (laughs) the app and I said, man, look at these numbers. And I kind of pissed him off a bit because, you know, we both realized, you know what, this should have been the first step. Right. And so I scuttled that. And then because of this failure and a couple other failures that I'd had, you know, where I just, that was a failure in execution, a failure in research. There was another thing that was just sort of like, I don't know, I just gave up on too early. And, you know, as this all went on, I was kind of pissing myself off. So I took a little break and I'm like, the next thing's really got to work. I'm like, I can't keep starting and stopping, starting and stopping. How do I go about this smarter? How do I get off on the right foot? And I'd come back to this idea. So this was like the end of 2012, the beginning of 2013. I'm like, you know, I had this idea on a train in Burma on my first time around the world in 2004, and it's been in my head ever since, Mm. and I just haven't done anything with it. And it's this travel apparel idea, this idea of travel clothes that are really nice, that don't look like this, you know, that don't look schlubby and don't look like you're on safari all the time. (laughs) And so I very, very slowly started to work on this project. Wasn't working every day or anything like that. You know, I was made a little bit lazy because, you know, I still had some money in the bank account. I hadn't stopped traveling and messing around. And I slowly started to learn how to be an entrepreneur And by the time things really kicked into high gear at the end of 2013, that's when the money really started to fly out of my bank account. Right. And I had to go and I had to find a factory in China or any, I didn't know I was going to be in China, but anywhere in the world that had the expertise to make what I was making. And then I had to pay a fabric expert to help me create this stuff. Then I had to pay for the actual development of the tangible good. And all of this, I went down this road simply because I had a strong feeling for this, you know, Mm. and the year prior to me really kicking it into high gear was a little bit of a soul search. Is this enough in me that I'm going to take this the distance? And I think that it was, and you know, you brought up the whole thing with a web app and programming and, you know, stuff like that, you know, and this is before the current FBA rush and things like that. You know, I just really took to physical goods much, much more. And I had no feeling for programming. I didn't want to be a programmer. I already saw this enormous tidal wave of people rush to the app economy. And I'm like, you know what? Warren Buffett always said, when people are rushing in, get out. And when people are rushing out, get in. Well, people were rushing into the apps and the everything else. And I'm like, they know what they're doing. And even if I did know what I was doing, technologically speaking, I don't think I'd be rushing in now. Mm. And 
you know, it wasn't long before everybody started pissing and moaning about how Apple changed this and changed that. And, you know, and people weren't making the same kind of money on apps that they were anymore and stuff like that. So that's good advice. You know, once you see the mad rush in, you really got to ask yourself if there's still some meat left on those bones. Mm. You raised a really interesting point, Carl, and that was about the fact that you like physical goods, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder as well, because you've seen this sort of app rush and it's happened over the last few years, right? Everybody's getting in, developing apps. So it's kind of like, that's really dominated the narrative, right? So this is how Mm -hmm. you can build a business and this is the kind of business you've got to build it and this is the way you build it and so on, right? But you've got a background in sales before Mm -hmm. doing this, right? And as a sales guy, as an entrepreneur, you've tried out different things and so on. As a sales guy to a sales guy, I kind of like can relate to what you're saying because I think us sales guys have that affinity with analog, right? And, you know, a lot of sales guys have worked in retail at some point in their life when they're starting out and very young because they like that kind of face-to-face interaction or they've done sort of field sales where they go out to the companies and, you know, they do the sort of traveling salesman type thing. But that was your background. I wonder how much of that has really sort of made you have this affinity with physical products and whether or not, you know, people listening, if they've got a good experience with sales and they love sales and they were good at it, right, they should also think about, you know, maybe the physical product is the way to go. Quite possibly, you know, I mean, starting out in apparel, one of the first things you think about is like, well, I'm going to have to go and talk to you you know, distributors, you know, or stores and stuff like that. And I felt very comfortable doing that kind of thing. Whereas I saw all these online marketers in Chiang Mai, the last thing they want to do is actually talk to somebody. Exactly. That took a long time for me to sink in. But then after I talked to these people and saw how, (laughs) you know, how they communicate with each other and how they'd rather text each other from across the room than actually deal (laughs) with one another face to face. I'm like, you know what? I might just want to play to my strengths here. Right. You know, so, but it's kind of ironic because, you know, I had a couple sales jobs, but by far and away, the most successful one was working for monster.com. And so I wasn't selling any physical goods. Right. But I was going into offices. I was dealing with decision makers, high level decision makers of very big companies. And I got out of that job with a high degree of confidence. And thinking about calling on some big, you know, department store or something like that somewhere in the world, I just didn't find daunting. I'm like, this is something that I can do that not everybody can do. Right. So I just felt like that was a competitive advantage. And I'll leave the apps and Amazon marketing to the guys that want to be uh, sitting in a laptop all day long. Right. Exactly. Really interesting. Play to your advantage, right? Yeah. I mean, the guys that I know who set up physical products and I've interviewed a couple of them here on Founder FM. We've got Jamal Benlude, who used to work for Monster Energy, you know, the oh, okay, uh, yeah. the, the, the energy drink, now sure. selling his own uh, water. They've got Vibe Desai, likewise based in LA, uh, and also Julian Hearn, who creates like a nutrition product. The interesting thing is that their biggest challenge always comes back to physical distribution. Yeah. 90% of the challenge for any kind of physical product is distribution. And that's really Well, you know, there's a, you know that book Traction? Yeah. Every chapter has a different author. But I remember in the very beginning, I was in a mastermind and one of the guys in Thailand actually recommended this for me. I don't have a marketing mind. I have a sales mind. And there's a lot of people that don't know there's a difference, but there's a huge difference. And this guy said, you know what, Kyle, you read Traction. I remember in the very beginning, he said, it is rare for a product to fail on its own. He says 90% of the time or 99% of the time, whatever he said, it's a failure of distribution. Right. He says that's why products fail, is they fail to distribute. It's not that people won't buy them. It's not that they have distribution and they're on the shelves and then all of a sudden they don't sell. It's like that's not the biggest concern. The biggest concern is just getting the distribution in the first place. Yeah, very true. So how do you focus your time knowing that that's your big challenge? Right. What do you do with yourself in the moment you get up and what's your kind of work there? What do you think about in terms of dealing with that challenge? Well, you know, there are a lot of shifts right now in the retail industry. Department stores are failing. You know, if if you listen to, you know, Wall Street News, you know, there are places like Macy's that are getting devastated. Mm. Amazon is dominating. And now you have Walmart that just bought Jet and they're going to make this enormous play. But Amazon is starting 300 of its own apparel brands. 
three hundred. Wow. And, and there's also Amazing. a lot of you know word on the street out there that you know a deal with like a big department store or something like that isn't what it used to be. So I spend my time right now trying to think about how to distribute the goods while building the brand, delivering a customer experience. You know, how do we do it on a large scale? There are some options out there, possibly, but we're in kind of a, you know, it's a challenging but exciting time because this has to be figured out. Me just going and meeting with Nordstrom and Macy's and whoever else look at my goods, I can easily walk out of those meetings saying it's not worth it. Right. And then this great idea that I had about being this killer salesman is just sort of out the window and I have to rethink this whole thing. But there are some emerging opportunities out there, and it's really just going to kind of, you know, be a matter of, I think, going in with people and trying to figure out what works with them and what works for us. Because all those people that are in these big companies like these department stores, they can't be feeling good right now. And Mm. if they keep doing the kind of deals that they're doing and doing business the way that they're doing, they're just going to keep going the direction that they're going. And that's not so good. So... Things are shifting. And so I can't put my faith just in my sales skills to go and meet with buyers. You know, I really kind of have to come up with creative solutions right now. So a lot of my job right now is kind of getting out there and researching and understanding what is available to me and then just coming up with stuff on my own and having the confidence to say, you know what? No one else is doing this. Why not? You know, why can't we do it? And Mm. how much would this take? And, you know so on so right and you tried kickstarter how did that experience go for you i think it went pretty good you know we got uh, just shy of ninety two thousand dollars during the month but uh, since then we've gotten i don't know thirty six thirty seven thousand dollars more of uh, pre-order so we actually have some pretty good traction i had an investor once tell me that he really didn't give a damn what i got on kickstarter he wanted to know what kind of residual orders I got after Kickstarter. Mm. Why was that? He said Kickstarter is a bit of a distraction. Yeah. I mean, you know, he felt like Kickstarter is a little bit more marketing. You know, it's like, you know, how good of a marketer are you and what kind of hype can you build? So he wanted to know how I was getting sales. You know, was I still advertising and marketing after Kickstarter? How were they coming in? He wanted to know what kind of real traction was out there and, and the best kind of traction would be sort of like this word of mouth. Mm. So, or the idea that if somebody was coming to my website after a Google search, you know, what my conversion rate was, you know, will they invest a hundred dollars on a shirt that doesn't, that's not uh, on the market yet. This is a pure pre-order that they haven't even tried on. Mm. And so to the degree that people are willing to take that risk after Kickstarter, that's been the more impressive number actually to some of these people that I've talked to. Right. But that's sort of your sales figures in the wild, so to speak, right? So yeah, that's kind of right. Right, raw stuff. I'm curious to know, I mean, you've been in this game now for a few years developing physical products. You know, you've, you've done all the retail side, the, the relationship side, the you know, the production side, all that kind of thing. I guess what you know now is kind of different to what you knew when you started out, even going way back to that trip in Burma in 2004, right? You know, where the idea was a seed in your head. You know, if somebody was looking at this and thinking, yeah, I'm going to start a apparel brand, and maybe this is a young guy straight out of college. If you could sit down with that guy and advise him for five minutes and just help him, yeah, accelerate up that curve or, you know, learn from some of your mistakes. What would you tell him? Well, first thing I would is I would give him articles to read and companies to research that have all started brands in different ways. Some people have done it on their own like me and gone the Kickstarter route. A lot of the Kickstarter apparel brands are kind of bringing new tech styles and things like that to the fore. But then there's some people out there that are just sort of you know, rehashing what's already been done, but maybe in a little bit of a more fresh way. And they're doing like like it's been done for years and years out of places like New York or London or something like that. And a couple of designers get together and make a few things and maybe get an investor behind them. And, you know, they sell these one-off shirts for $250 without any kind of reputation in the marketplace. You know, and then I've got to sell my shirt for 130 bucks retail at Kickstarter, but these people make a couple of things for 250 bucks and people snap it up all day long. That kid has got to answer why that is. Mm. 
Yeah. You know, he needs to read these articles, see these dozens of different approaches to these companies and ask himself, why does this cotton polka dot shirt for men that these people didn't even make their own fabric, but they went to some really cool fabric shop, got this fabric, made a relatively ordinary shirt and slapped a giant price tag on it and put it in this cool area of Los Angeles and it sells for 250 bucks. How did that happen? And then I spent years and thousands of dollars developing my own fabric, going to China and this and that. And then I got to hustle these things for a hundred bucks at a time and have people question me constantly if it actually does what it says it's going to do. You know, it kind of makes you wonder. It's sort of like (laughs) these other people aren't making travel clothing. I'm doing something with a very specific problem and solution in mind. But that's something that I have to ask myself. How do I bring that side of the apparel business, that kind of branding and that kind of approach, and how do I apply it to what I'm doing to increase my margins? That's exactly the kind of thing that I would tell some kid. Mm. I'd pull back the curtain. I would say, listen, you know, here are some of the more difficult things that I have to deal with. It's not all about designing shirts, and it's not all about having fun going to China. But, you know, here's how I've lost money. Here's how the factory in China is difficult to deal with. And here are the cultural difficulties. And and then there are just a million things. Mm. And so I'd pull back the curtain, but there is more than one way to skin a cat. So anybody listening to this that wants to research me and thinks, oh, Kickstarter's the way to go, because I've seen Libertad and I've seen all these other brands, you know, do hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is what I'm going to do. I would not say that's a given. I would say, find out how other people are doing it and find out the science behind branding and pricing and selling apparel, because there's a lot of great information out there, you know? Yeah. So great advice. And interviewing Sam Marks last week, one of the things he said about shortcut to success is to go and work for somebody who is doing it, right? So if you're a young guy starting out and you want to get into physical products or retail or whatever, the best way to learn is to, you know, contact somebody like Carl and say, hey, look, I'll come and work for you for free. You just teach me what you know. Everything that you just told me. I'll come and work for you for three for a month or I'll come to Chiang Mai and do this and I can be your acolyte. I can be your apprentice, right? You know, that's a great sure. way to do it, right? And that's how people can yeah. get up the learning curve. I think that is. I think had I done that, you know, I would have been better off than I am now. I mean, my company is alive and we're going to do fine, but I'm 45, you know, and I think that, you know, when I started this at 42, 43 years old, I felt like, you know, I think I gave into this ticking clock, But, you know, if I was a guy coming out of college and stuff like that, and, you know, I would say just go to work for somebody, apprentice somewhere and soak it all up, just like you're saying, whatever field you want to go into. Yeah, totally good advice. Well, I'm 44, so join the club. Do you ever get, just out of interesting, I I know we talked off tape about your background. You also mentioned as well that you had a very successful career. and That was one of the motivators why you left it in a way. And something that I've felt as well, I had a very successful business career in my late 20s, early 30s, and had a very successful business. But a thought that creeps into my head, especially in my 40s now, I'm slightly changing gears a little bit here, is you sometimes, you know, when you're starting a new business, A, you don't have 120 hours a week to work on it like you used to, right? But also, Mm -hmm. there's that doubt in your head that, oh, maybe, you know, your best years are behind you. Or maybe, you know, being in your 40s now is not the right age to be doing this, right? I know it's kind of like something that is irrational, but do you ever get that kind of thing that pops into your head from time to time? And how do you deal with it? Right. Well, it does pop into my head and I think it pops into everybody's head, but how I deal with it is that all my life, and I'll go back to when I was learning how to scuba dive, you know, there are a lot of scuba diving instructors around the world that are pretty young and they got in there, you know, they said to themselves, I want to live on a boat and on the beach and teach people how to dive. And you know what? They found a great job, but they're very young. And the guy that taught me my open water, you know, some guy in his twenties, he did okay. But it was such, you know, his knowledge, I could tell, was not very broad and deep. And so when I went to get my advanced open water diving certificate, I found this guy that had a whole lot of gray hair. Mm. And and he was a fantastic teacher. And he had something like 10,000 dives. And 
you know, I remember just the quality of instruction. There was just no comparison. So when I start to think my best years are behind me and stuff, I think about these people who I actually seek advice from and who I seek, you know, to gain knowledge from. And they all have a whole lot of gray hair. I'm not a believer. I think maybe their most energetic years are behind them. But I think, though, that they have often the best information. They're not swayed by fads. You know, I see a lot of young guys, and this happens to me sometimes too, get a little caught up in the moment, you know, but you see these older guys, they don't get too uptight. They don't get too caught up in the moment. They don't think that they need to invest in something right away because it's the investment of a lifetime. So they need to throw their money in now. They don't get sucked into that kind of stuff. And, you know, so while younger guys, you know, getting their advice on how to reach let's say how to market to the younger generation, you know, how to market using Snapchat. They have a lot of really great creative ideas, but for the guys that sort of have a more global or complete view of things, I look for that gray hair, Mm -hmm. you know, and they often, you know, always come down to values and principles and things that have just been tried and true through the generations, things that have not changed. And, you know, they will often counsel you to really kind of hold tight to that kind of stuff. And all of these other things that come and go are just sort of surface tremors, mm-hmm. you know, flashes in the pan. And so I'm not, you know, I don't have the same kind of energy that I used to have, but it also forces me to look at my business differently. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't wake up saying I'm going to grind out eight hours today. You know, I look at things that need to be done and I look at things that are important and I use my experience to tell me what's really important and what just seems important. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to use that experience to give me a little bit of clarity and so that I don't go around chasing things and doing things that are not important and just kind of try to be confident that if I focus on what's truly important, what will yield sales and make my company stronger, you know, if I focus on that and not worry about working 12 or 16 hours a day and to make me feel like I'm being productive. Mm. I try to honor my own experience and the experience of the people that have kind of gone before me. So that's really my thought on it. You know, the younger guys are fantastic. They're so creative. I love listening to them and stuff like that. But when you see how they go about their day sometimes and some of the things they focus on, you can tell that that's going to change with a little bit of time and experience. Mm. Words of wisdom there from Carl. You seem to be an incredibly disciplined and focused guy. Well, at least you give oh. me that impression. <laughs> I just give you that impression. All right. <laughs> it's like everybody is not. They're disciplined on the outside, but there's a crisis on the inside, right? Oh, yeah, man. We're all the same. I mean, we'd same. all rather be just laying on the beach somewhere with a hot chick, you know, just without a care in the world. You know, I dig my work and everything, but, you know, not every day is a great day. Yeah, of course. So those days that are difficult, I'm not so productive, you right. know, so... That's just the way that it is. And, you know, when I was a salesman, you know, I would do everything that had to be done in about 15 minutes in a day. Anything that really, really mattered. I mean, I was at work all day long, but what mattered was accomplished in some 15 minute time period in any given day. Yeah, so true. Yeah, Yeah, I screwed off the rest of the time. Yeah, well, but on the payroll, right? The bottom line is is the paycheck. You know, the bottom line is what you sold, you know, the signatures on which contracts. And I learned over my time, like with places like Monster, that, you know, I didn't have to give anybody the impression I was working hard because I worked from home. But I had to definitely make the sales. And, And the things that mattered as I look back on those years at Monster, literally, Most of the time happened on one phone call or one email on one day at a time. It was not all my emails that day or all my phone calls. I look back on, I'm like, man, you know, I got to step up to the plate. It's like I'm a designated hitter. I don't play the whole ball game. Right. I'm using the sports analogy. Sorry, this is a baseball analogy for the American listeners. No, we get it. Do you get it? They call some guy off the bench and he hasn't done anything and he's expected to hit a home run. Right, right. Here he comes. He's got to hit the home run and he does. Right. There you go. And that's kind of how I looked at sales. I was always a designated hitter. That's true, though. I mean, with your experience now, I mean, this is something that I find, and especially if you're running your own business and you manage your own time, is not be afraid to take time out, recharge, rather than just work your way from, you know, dawn to dusk and grind yourself yeah. out. I get up, I work hard in the morning, I take a break throughout the day, and then I work hard in the evening. 
But, you know, I think if I was younger, I'd just work hard from start to right. stop, right? Right. Now you're saying, right, you've got to understand that all the values created often in these small, you know, super valuable windows of time. And then right. everything else is just kind of like shifting paper around the desk, so to speak. It really is. That's exactly what happens. And so I try to recognize those periods and get out of the office and clear my mind. So when those valuable time windows come about, when I have a phone conversation planned or something like, or I have to write a critical email, I'm ready. I'm mentally prepared. I'm not tired. I've given everything due consideration. I've written notes and gone over and over and over it so that I knock it out of the park. Exactly. And that's what I try to do. That's fantastic. Well, it's been inspirational listening to you. I want to finish up just by talking a little bit about one of your passions, and that's travel. I know you've written somewhere. Mm -hmm. You've described three reasons why we should travel. These are, I'll remind <laughs> you, because this is probably a while Good. ago. <laughs> Good. So it was you who wrote this. I'm not putting words in your mouth. Transformation, right. adventure, yeah. romance. Right. Dis discuss. Tell us why. What is transformation, adventure, romance? Well, I think that, you know, I don't think we should be shy about talking about any of these things. I think transformation and adventure, you know, people readily acknowledge and talk about in our society and stuff like that. And I don't think those need much explanation, although I think everybody should be prepared to constantly change and challenge themselves and reach new heights and have adventures. But, you know, part of the whole Libertad thing is when I look and I'm choosing colors for the shirts and the shape of the shirts and the overall aesthetic and stuff like that, I am mostly thinking about the romance component. You know, it's funny, you know, you, you look at a lot of these brands and stuff like that, the new brands and stuff, and it's very focused, you know, and I'm guilty of the same thing. We talk about why wool doesn't stink and why it doesn't wrinkle so much or why some other brand uses this silver ion technology to do this and that and, you know, in, in their cotton or polyester. And we forget that, you know, when we travel, especially as guys out there that are unattached, we wouldn't mind having a nice dinner with a really beautiful, exotic stranger at a hotel, right. you know, and look awesome at the same time. And I, point blank, this is an enormous reason why I travel, mm. you know, and, and I think that it is the romance and sort of that kind of thing that, that can lead to a certain kind of adventure and transformation. And, you know, I've been to the Great Wall of China. I've been to the Grand Canyon. I've been to Eiffel Tower. I've been to Antarctica and stuff like that. And those places have been beautiful. But I told you before we started recording, or you mentioned to me that, you know, my favorite place in the world was Buenos Aires. And, you know, we really didn't get right down to it, but it was really the romance, you know, it's mm -hmm. an electric city and yeah. you, know, you go out and you meet cute girls and, you know, you, you dance the tango with them. And this is the stuff that life is really made of. You know, I talk way, way more about going to Antarctica and stuff like that. But, you know, the reason for, you know, the clothing brand and stuff like that really is this romance component. And I want it to be part of my brand. I want people to really just kind of not be shy about it and want to look awesome and confident when they walk up to that sexy stranger to ask for their phone number. Awesome. Well, you see, I was right. It was Jason Bourne, man. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's what it boils down to. But you're living the life and. I'm sure a lot of people would want to do what you're doing, even just to put their foot forward and start that journey, right? Where, where can we find out more about you, Carl? About me, I'm not really sure. that. I mean, I don't have much online about me. You can certainly find Libertad, libertadapparel.com, but right. there well, are pieces there. of my yeah. story. Yeah, there's pieces of my story there. You know, but, you know, I have a really skimpy LinkedIn page and, you know. <laughs> <I love. laughs> but you're a man of mystery. That kind of plays to your image, right? You don't want to if give everybody everything. anybody comes through Chiang Mai or LA, send me an email. And uh, if we can, we'll have some coffee and tell some stories. Awesome. Dance a bit of tango. Yeah. Carl, you're an inspiration. It's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. And, you know, I've really enjoyed talking to you and feel like I've lived vicariously a little bit through your adventures as well. Thanks so much, Graham. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, well, thanks for sharing. That's Carl Barraclough, everybody, the founder of Libertad Apparel. Also, world traveler, adventurer, entrepreneur, a little bit of Jason Bourne. We'll put the details in the show notes so you can find out a little bit more about him. And as he says, if you pass through Chiang Mai in Thailand, which I recommend if you're an entrepreneur starting out, go and check him out. Carl, thanks for joining us on the show. 
Thanks, Graham. Founder FM, voice of the entrepreneur. Find out more at www.founderfm.com.